fighting for this title. And he's going to go to Middlesbrough and get something. And, and I'll tell you, honestly, I will love it if we beat them. Yes, everyone, welcome back for another episode of The Warm Down. Delighted to be joined by youth historian Tony Park, someone that I enjoy watching the matches with, and uh, I don't reckon we're going to be seeing much of those together in the very near future at least. But we've had, I would say, relatively successful season this year in the under-18s. We've seen the emergence of some real five-star potential players. Uh, Hannibal Mabry is probably one that springs to mind. I think Charlie McCann's had a fantastic season. Uh, Dylan Hugenworth looks like he might be the real deal. Tony, thank you for joining me. And um, what's your thoughts? How would you grade this season for uh, the 18s and the 23s? Well, it's a pretty young group of players. Uh, we've Apart from one of the the obvious ones, like you've got Mason, who's jumped a couple of steps. He's gone almost from the 18s. He, as you know, he can still play in the Youth Cup this season, but you know, high, high, highly unlikely to do that at all. Um, and he's jumped the reserves and straight into the first team. So um, given that it's a very, very young squad, I think they've done OK. They've uh, consolidated a number of positions. And I think the group, there's almost like um, a secondary group behind this lot, Steve, with... Um, uh, a whole bunch of lads who have come into the club at that 16, 17 level, and they just haven't had a chance to to show anything because um, there's a, it's a big squad. It's a big squad. So I think I think the next season will be interesting to see how they all do. I think there's some guys in their 23s who probably will – some of them need loans, and so there'll be some spaces clearly for the second half of this season or whatever's left of this season. The chances are that won't happen. So we're now really looking, I think, for when, whenever the season, the new season starts, looking at which of those players need to go on loan, which of those players' contracts are up. And then as, as is the normal cycle of youth football, which of the 18s are going to step up? And then, as I said, this secondary group, and I'm talking about the likes of uh, Zinad Iqbal, um, I'm talking who scored a really nice goal um, against Sunderland recently. He's a fan um, of the spectacular, isn't he? He's, he's, he's a really nice player. We'll talk about him in a bit, I suppose, but he's a really nice player. And there's a few like that who, who haven't got a chance, who haven't had a chance because of the, the size of the squad. But as uh, Neil Ryan has been um, prioritising the Youth Cup for some of the games in recent in recent months, uh, it's given a chance for the likes of Svidersky, uh, Zidane and one or two others to, to show what good players they are. And we just haven't seen a lot of them because they we haven't really had an under-16 league uh, playing this season, United haven't really uh, put 16 team together, and all they've been doing is playing lots and lots and lots of under 17 youth friendlies behind closed doors. So obviously, watching them is is almost impossible, and getting any determination about who's playing well is very difficult. Um, all I'm getting in terms of my uh, intel is is the names of the, you know the squad. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting again, and that, and that's what youth football, that's why youth football is so interesting. You just, you just never know what's going to what's going to happen. Who's going to come forward? Who's going to excel? Who's going to you know plateau off? And and that's the that's the reason why we love it so much. Um, I've not really had a chance to speak to you since uh, the Astana away game, where we saw surely one of the youngest starting 11s that United have ever fielded, uh, certainly in European competition, but I, I would think probably in all first team competition. Um, was there a bit of a sense of pride, do you think, for some of the youth watchers looking at that starting eleven, and and who do you think really shone in that game? It's it's an interesting one because every, everybody says, you know, well, Solskjaer had nothing to. He didn't need to do that. No. He could have easily played a whole bunch of experienced players, uh, and he did. He played Luke Shaw, who needed some game time. He played Lee Grant, obviously, for to getting some match action, but he could have played a number of other players just to tick a box. And I think Fergie would have. But, but Solskjaer didn't. Solskjaer definitely decided not to travel that way with his squad. He wanted to prioritise the league game that followed that. And he thought, this is we're going to really find out who's going to step up here. Um, there was a few, actually. I, I thought I thought Dene, uh, Dijon Bernard had a good game. Weirdly, even though he conceded an own goal, I thought... I thought he played really well. I thought he he's he's been a real surprise to me. When he first came from Chelsea, I wasn't I wasn't overly enamoured. I not overly enamoured with him as a person necessarily, but I just thought he wasn't any better than what we already had. But he's slowly developing into a you know a very solid defender. So he he um he was someone who I thought, wow, he's really come on come on really well. 
Um, Ethan Laird, is, I'm a big fan of Ethan Laird, as you know. I thought he was outstanding in that game. Uh, his injuries uh, will, will at some point become a worry for him, I think, because every time he comes back, he seems to get another niggle. So I don't know what's wrong there. Mm. Uh, but I thought I was very impressed with him. Uh, Dylan Levitt, I think, again, one or two of them have just got these little niggles that have stopped their development a little bit. And um, what was also good is just to see one or two of them get a get a run from the bench, the Ramazani's and the Damani Mellers, and but it's been it's been a really interesting season. But yeah, it was it was great to see them. Yeah, I, I agree on quite a few of those. And like you said, I think Levitt and Laird are the two that come to the foremost. Where you go injuries at just the wrong time of the season, yeah. where you may have seen a a slight little bit more extended run in the first team. Uh, I, I thought um, Dylan's performance in that a hundred passes. I, I don't care what level you're playing. But and certainly at the pitch that we saw out in Astana, to be throwing a hundred passes around is outrageous. Um, I was very, very impressed with that. And I think you're totally and also, right. They weren't, they weren't worried about it either. They looked very, mm. very composed. And even them, even though we lost, we lost the game. They didn't seem overly concerned about that either. You know, they it was part of part of the next step of their development. And so, very professional performance. And I think Ollie would have been really happy with the professionalism of the performance. Mm over and above anything else. Yeah, and I think you're right. Oli did not need to do that. And probably almost 100% of managers would have um, would have been fine with going with a fairly strong but rotated side. But I think if you look at what Oli has done since joining the club, even if you go back to probably the biggest game of his career so far in Paris, he brought on Mason Greenwood. He brought on yeah. Chong. He travelled with uh, Brandon Williams, who didn't make the bench in the end. But all of these players were involved. I think Angel Gomez was on the bench. I think, you know, this isn't a fleeting thing to appease the fans. He brought those players on in that game. And those players, you know, you, you can see them in the celebration when Marcus puts the penalty away. I think this is who Oli really is. I think he really is. You know, whatever he's got with Nicky Butt being in his ear about which players they, they want to be developing in the first team. But he's definitely listening. I think the emergence of Brandon Williams to to put the pressure that we've seen under Luke Shaw in the first team, the the management of Mason Greenwood actually. Let's go into that because the management of Mason Greenwood seems to be like the most deliberately managed transition from youth football to men's football that I think I might have ever seen. I don't think I've ever noticed anyone that's been almost road mapped through it the way Mason has been. Fergie did it a little bit like that with Giggs and Sharp. And he, he, he'd do something really interesting, Stephen, for, and for older fans watching this, they'll probably remember. He would often play gigs at left back, and he certainly played Lee Sharp at left back on many occasions, just to take him out of the limelight. And then he'd put him back in the A-team for a few games. And if you look at those early 1990, 1991 seasons, and if you look at any of the records at that time, you'll often find gigs back in the reserves for four games or five games, or certainly Sharp he was. And then he'd bring them back in. So it was, it was very deliberate management. Much less so with the class of 92, much less so with um, some of the Wes Browns and O'Shea's and Fletcher's and what have you. Um, and as and as the game has changed, what you see a lot now is you see a lot of people coming into the squad but not playing any youth football. So particularly someone like, for example, um, Darren Fletcher. So Darren, once he got into the first team, he rarely played reserve football. Even if he didn't play in the first team, he was just travelling all the time. Well, what Solskjaer's doing, and you see it, as you say, very deliberate, is Mason will play in the reserves. Mason or um, Brandon will play in the reserves. Uh, Chong and Garner and, and Gomez, they'll play in the reserves. So he's giving them game time so that they don't get that rustiness or whatever, but he's keeping them around the first team squad as well. And, and as I say, Mason's probably ahead of the curve with most of those, Brandon as well to an extent. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. And I think he's done a great job in in not pushing him too soon and not allowing the press to get hold of him and, and trying to manage the hype. We all know the hype's going to be big anyway, but managing the hype as much as possible. And Mason's pretty grounded. He's a, he's a fairly grounded character anyway, which is going to help him. Yeah, I think he's almost... Uh, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to think of a way to say this without it being insulting to him, but he's almost dead in terms of how chilled out he is, isn't he? There's, there's zero emotion with him. I don't think he gets excited. I don't think he gets nervous. I genuinely think he gets more excited playing Fortnite than he does um, coming on in front of 75,000 people and, and playing Old Trafford. Uh, just the, well, imp very, the impression I get. He's very introverted. I think, you know, he's, he's not, he's not, hasn't got that extrovert character that you see from a, 
uh, from an example, I'm just trying to think who 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 would be the example. Oh, Scott McTominay. Scott is very extrovert. In, in everything that he does, he's very vocal on the pitch. He's he's um, incredibly expressive with the way you know and, and you know all of those types of things. So he's almost the opposite of someone like Scott. But again, um, very deliberate in how they go about things. I and mean, Scott's you know a consummate professional. I think Mason's very professional. In everything he does, you you know, which is what you expect. You know, he's, he's comes from his family's very grounded. Um, you've, you've obviously spoke to his parents at Carrington. I, I think I remember you having a quick chat with them one day, you know, very grounded people, very, you know, down to earth and, and Mason's obviously picking that up. Yeah. I, I get the impression that he's got, um, a, a decent head on him and I think he, he's advised fairly well as well. I know he's not got an agent. I think his family deals with that's it. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably a, a, a generally positive thing. Uh, when that's the sort of thing that's going on. You know, I like the speed at which his contract was settled up in the summer. Um, it's not been allowed to drag on like a couple of the other contracts that are kicking around. And I, I think for me, that had to be an example for some of the others in the squad for the season. You know, he was offered a contract, he signed the contract, and he's, not only has he played a hell of a lot of football in the first team this season, but, you know, even as people that have watched him for years, would you have thought, double figures goals for Mason this season was realistic because I don't think I would have done. It's, it's interesting. The Premier League at the moment, in my opinion, particularly the last three or four years, I think is favouring his type of footballer. If you'd gone back three or four or five years, I think he would have been, people would have been overly physical with him, which is, which is the, the, the question mark that I think most people have with young players coming into the game. Rashford, I think, got it just in his first season, 215, 216. He started to get that kind of, he was pushed off the ball a lot. He was very physical. The game now is just in these last four or five years has got less physical again. You almost can't touch anybody now, you know, with that kind of stuff. Especially with VAR, and, that, that's yeah. not, and that helps him because he's got amazing balance. He can go left, right, as everybody, I mean, I don't need to tell everybody how he plays. They can see for themselves. But, you know, one thing he, he is, he's, he's very lightweight and that will change as he starts to grow. But because of the game has changed so much, I think it's allowed Ollie probably to put him in more often um, because I, you're quite right. I, I think the emotional side of the game doesn't bother him at all. I think his temperament is, is absolutely fine. I think from a physical perspective, he, he, the, 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 the modern game is helping him deal with the physicality because there isn't that much. The only side I think that, that we don't know about is the intellectual side. And that's just, you know, how do you cope from, you know, having that intensity all the time mm. and dealing with that intensity, which is, you know, it's just brain tiredness, brain dead. You know, you, you know yourself when you're working long hours, you get to that point and you build that kind of resilience. He hasn't built that resilience yet because uh, that will only come in time. So once he gets his head around that, I think Ollie will feel even more comfortable pushing him forward. But he's done the right thing. Every time he looks a little bit tired, take him out of the limelight. Yeah, I, I said, I think he's been extremely well managed. So credit to maybe you know, behind the scenes with his family and certainly the coaches and the manager for, for the, the transition that he's currently going through looks absolutely fantastic. Um, what's your thoughts on some people saying that we shouldn't sign X or Y because they'll stunt his development? Because when you see... Just in Marcus's time at the club, you know, Tony Marshall was signed in the summer. Marcus made his debut. Um, he's had Zlatan, he's had Lukaku, he's had Sanchez. And, you know, he's pretty much rose above all of those and survived all of those. And and, he, and I think when you're a good player, you will find a way into the team. Do you, do you think that Mason would thrive on some competition or do you think it would hinder his chances if someone was signed uh, in a similar role to him? I think that's always the challenge that you've got. And the... And the I kind of asked three questions. Question number one, whoever we sign, are they going to make the team better? So if the te if it's going to make the team better, and, and we can argue backwards and forwards whether Schweinsteiger made the team better, mm. whether Daley Blinn made the team better, whether Marcus Rocco made the team better, we can argue over those things. But when you get someone like, um, and I'm, again, I'm just pulling names out of a hat here, but when you get someone like a Cristiano Ronaldo, does he make the, make our team look better? Well, yeah. So, so it doesn't matter if he's stunting someone's growth. Yeah. You know, he's he's going to come to the club as an 18 year old and you say to every other kid in the academy, learn from him, watch him, play with him, use use him as your role model. I don't think Mason would argue with that. I think where some of these kids will get a little bit more frustrated is if if we sign somebody. And, and I'm saying this in the nicest possible way, like an Odion Igalo, 
you know, some strikers at the club may say, well, is he going to get more game than me? I don't think someone like Mason should be worried about Odeon. You know, Mason's career, and if you're good enough, you will forge your own career. Mm. So I think from a, from a first perspective is, will it make the team better? The second question is, can the youngsters learn from them? What, what are these other people bringing in that they can then learn some attributes, like a Cristiano or, or a Nanny or somebody, or even a Wayne Rooney? You know, there's an attitude there. Um, and that's the second thing that I would ask. And the third thing you've got to ask is, have we got the right cover? So as you saw in the last part of the, you know, the, the games we had, with, when Marcus got injured and Marshall had a little bit of a knock, you almost had Mason and, and Daniel James leading the line. And look at the experience of Premier League football that those two guys had. It was very minimal. So you actually needed somebody, which is why, you know, Ingalo came into the squad because we were light. So I think if we went out and bought a Harry Kane, no one would argue, including Mason. I think he would thrive on that. Going out and buying a lesser quality player, there's a huge question mark there, I think. Yeah, and I think uh, I think perhaps Ingalo probably wasn't the best example because I think he brings something that we don't have in the squad in terms of hold-up play. Uh, but yeah, I think if we brought in a, an ordinary right-back, I think Ethan Laird... That's like, what I'm getting at. What, what are we doing here? Or you know, if there was a, a ball-playing young midfielder you know, with two or three Premier League games, I think Dylan Levitt would be right to be like, hang on, like, you know, I'm on the verge of being an international here for Wales. You know, I've had one game and I was you know, near flawless in it. Do I not get one more chance? Um, yeah, I think you're totally right on that, yeah. Um, and, us, and, and talk about midfield for a second. There's been loads of talk about Madison and Declan Rice and Jack Grealish. And, and, and you probably, in, in some of your um, podcasts, have been talking about numerous other players that we've been linked to in that midfield area. All of them. What does so <laughs> All of them. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And what does that, what does that say to, to Dylan and to Jimmy Garner and to Angel Gomez you know, and, and I think you have to be careful because one of the things about youth development is sending the right messages to say, you can still make it here, we'll give you a chance. And we have done that, but have we given them enough chance? Brandon, yes. Um, Scott McTominay, yes. Mason, yes. Jesse and, and Marcus, obviously, a few seasons back, yes. One or two others, I'm not sure you could argue they've got their – I think, to be fair, I think Chong's got his chance. Mm. I think – from a maturity wise, I think he's going to get better. Um, I'm glad he signed a contract. I think he will improve. I think he lacks a little bit of confidence at first team level. I think he's trying too hard, um, and that that'll come with experience. But you know, you, you can't. You, we, the other thing, of course, is we've got other players that perhaps shouldn't be there, and Ollie's doing a great job in getting rid of that and therefore creating openings. Yeah, and the the openings is is a big one, I think, because where we've managed to successfully plug the squad where we've had the likes of Chong and, and I'll even include the likes of Dan James. I know he's not an academy player, but he was a young player uh, forging mm. a career. I, he goes in the same category for me uh, as somebody like Chong. Um, what we've not seen, we've not really seen because of who's been available and, and the holes that we've had in the squad. We've not seen Jimmy Garner given an opportunity more than he should have got or what he's got. You know, Dylan should have had perhaps more. We've had almost flawless fullback in wan Basaka, which has, uh, has pretty much blocked the line a little bit for Ethan Laird. And I understand, you know, why Ollie wouldn't want to, to risk anything at fullback. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how next season goes. Um, I would have to say the most impressive performance that I've seen so far this season, um, it almost feels like talking about last season now, because it does feel like the season's over, doesn't it? It almost feels like it, <laughs> it's not going to come back. I, don't, I have no idea. We, we both have no idea whether that's going to happen. Um, but I would have to say Hannibal Mabry for me has to be a shoe in for the under eighteen player of the year. What's your thoughts? Him or Mengi? I think. Oh God, yeah, actually, do you know what? Yeah, I forgot about Mengi. I, I think the what you've what you've seen with Mengi last season was a transition year for him. I, th- I think in twenty seventeen eighteen he he really shone through, and and you kind of wondered whether it was his physicality. And then last year he 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 plateaued a little bit, and so I had a I had a kind of question mark in my own brain about has has he got to where he is going to get like a Tyler a Terrell Warren type of um, you know plateau, and I was a very big Terrell Warren fan, and he kind of just shocked what's happened to him actually. Yeah, he, and he just plateaued and he just didn't move forward, um, and then what happened was you you got the Youth Cup this year, 
and Tedden's just gone the, all this. He's just not made a step up. It's a huge stride, um, you know. And obviously, he, he got the, the the opportunity in Astana as well. And I should have mentioned his name there. And I, I've been very impressed with his leadership. I've been very impressed with his with his captaincy. I've been very impressed with his um, ball playing, not just defending, but ball playing. Um, and I think from an, from a perspective of player of the year, um, he's he's almost been faultless in in every aspect of the game um, at under eighteen level, and you know moving into the twenty threes. So while Mejbury has um, certainly taken some of the headlines with his his amazing balance and his ability and and you know his clear talent, um, I probably would would choose Tin Mengi. Yeah, Joe, I think that's probably been, I was being a little unfair on Mengi because Mengi has been a, a colossus this season. Uh, and I think you're right, the FA Youth Cup run in particular, um, it's a shame that we're not going to get a conclusion of that because I do think this United team, more so than other years, other years when we've had Angel and we've had Mason playing in it rather than you know being on paper a member of the squad but clearly not yeah. involved, they've been better equipped, it seems, to go on and do something and they've all failed. Whereas maybe this team, because it wasn't as fancied, has got a bit more character about it or a bit more team play about it. Or I don't know, just something where you think these guys could actually go on and win this thing, couldn't they? Yeah, I think so. And of course, what's changed this season, and I think last season as well, is they've changed everything to, to one games as opposed to um, a home and away. So in previous years, going back 50, 60, 70 years, the semi-finals were home and away and the final was home and away. This year, as last year, I think, it's now just wherever you're drawn. So I think we're drawn. If we beat Chelsea, I think we're drawn away in the final as well. So if we win it, we're going to have to win it difficult. Uh, Chelsea is still a good side, even though we beat them last year. They've got a very strong team. So that was always going to be a tough one to, to manage down at Stamford Bridge. However, nothing was beyond us. I, th- I think what you'll see when you've got youth teams, if you look at the cycle, you'll always have one season or two seasons or three seasons where it's not a great group. But there's, a, there's certain individuals that, you know, excel, like you've just mentioned. And then you get this every third or fourth year, you get a, a great group of individuals. So I don't know if you remember watching the 2002-2003 Youth Cup winning team that we had. Not a lot of individual brilliance. Wasn't that as a, Rossi and Petrucci? No, no, that, no, was, that, was, that was 2005. Uh, 2003 was Bardsley, Paul McShane, Tom Heaton, um, uh, Lee Lawrence, um, Ben Collett, Chris Eagles, Kieran Richardson, uh, Ebanks Blake. So you had um, individually, not a lot of them went on to, you know, one or two did, but they didn't really make outstanding, you know, contributions at Man United. But as a collective, they were very, very great. They were a great team. They were very hard to beat and they won everything that year. They won the league. They won the FA Youth Cup. So they were they were a really strong unit. And you get one of those every three or four years. You'll just get a strong unit. What you had in 2011 is you had both. Yes. And that's really rare. So in 2011, you had an incredibly strong unit, one of the strongest units I've seen as a team. And what it included was individual talents that made the unit even stronger in the likes, obviously, of Morrison and Pogba and Will Keane and, and all the others. <laughs> that That was... I mean, yeah, that was a great youth team. Obviously, uh, Jesse probably played a little bit more central in that. Who, yeah, he did, yeah. Who was your favourite player in that team? Because Tom Thorpe. Yeah. Tom Thorpe. If anyone, I, how he's not made a pro footballer is beyond me. Absolutely beyond me. I always thought he would make a better right back than a centre half. Um, but he had everything that I thought he, he would make. Even to this day, I still can't work out why he didn't make it. I thought I was a big fan of Tony Cliff in that season. Uh, and was Ben Pearson the same year, or was he the year after? No, he was a couple of years after. Yeah, I thought Tunnicliffe was a, as a real player in that team. Obviously, you had a bit of uh, a bit of sparkle with Pogba and Morrison, but yeah, the whole unit of a team were just juggernaut through teams, wasn't it? It was a, that was a brilliant team to watch. Uh, I thought the team a few years ago actually with Axel and um, and Rochon was a similar sort of unit, but never did anything like that. Well, it was interesting. They had a good, they had a good strong back four because you had Cameron on one side, you had um, um, Tyler at left back who went down to Swansea, of course, um, and then you had Roshan and um, Axel in the centre. So your back four was incredibly strong. Then what you had in front of that was a little bit weaker. You had 
You had, I think Joe Rothwell was injured for a lot of spell during yeah, this that was period. Yeah, James Weir, uh, Josh Harrop. This was this era. That's wasn't right. it? Some good players yeah. in that. Very good players. Very good players. So, but I think Josh was injured a lot of that time at that period as well. Um, I think Jack Barmby was was around that period. Maybe a little bit. No, he was maybe a little bit earlier. But um, it, was a, it was it was a really strong team. But they they always seemed to have a mistake in them. They always seemed to just have that kind of game that just didn't work out. But again, the, quite. I mean, we're talking about Axel. You know, I'm really pleased going back to the Ollie thing. You know, Ollie's got rid of Rocco. You mm. know, got rid of Smalling to Roma. You know, and then unfortunately Axel's been injured because I thought he could have come in and come in and done a job next to Maguire. That would have been a fantastic season for him. But let's hope let's hope next season he can push on. Yeah, he's played well whenever he's featured, and it, it looks great. And after the season that he had at Villa last year, I thought everyone was really expecting him to step up. But again, just injuries, and that that might end up being the story of his career because in terms of ability, I don't think I've ever seen a more natural defender than, than and that, composed. Than oh. And the attitude, he's got all the components. He's athletic, you know, he's quick. So, you know, fingers crossed for Axel. Yeah. Um, give us a little word on Mabry then. Uh, do you think he's a real deal? Or do you think he's, um, there's more to meets the eye that I need to see about him? No, I, I think he's the real deal. I think he's got, if you look at a player, um, you look at certain players and you, and you look at them and you go, wow, what balance. And for, for him, he nothing scares him. His, his temperament's, in that respect, he's, he's very confident. He's always wanting the ball. Uh, he's always moving into position. When he gets the ball, he, I think he I think he thinks quicker than a lot of the other eighteen that he's working with, uh, which is no which is no detriment to any other player. That sometimes happens. So I think he will probably be suited to higher level football, um, as as players in the past have been. He just, he's just that second ahead. I think what's been mentioned by a couple of people, you, you, you've probably been aware of it. He seems to get booking in every single game. Um, and so as he gets a consequence, he moans at the refs and the refs get very fed up with him. So he, he loses lots of free kicks that he should often get because mm. the refs are fed up with him just complaining all the time. So I think he needs to understand how to manage that component of his game. Um, and I think if when he gets to a higher level, if he gets some clever defenders who will try to wind him up, he he will get caught out with that, and that will affect his game. So I think the man management of Hannibal Medry will be really interesting next season and the season on. I think he'll be a 23 player next season. I think he's, he's good enough to move up straight away. Um, and I he I think he may well be him and yeah I think he may well be the one to get it to get a glimpse at first team at perhaps next season before anyone else. Yeah, I was wondering. I mean, I I don't think there'll be a preseason tour this year. I think preseason is very likely to be domestic, if at all. It might just be a, a pure in, internal camp that they do. But if there is any sort of preseason tour, I think Mabry would be one of the players that I think a lot of fans would like to see uh, drafted in and given some opportunities on that tour. Yeah, again, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the loan system because we've still got players out on loan. You know, Ethan Hamilton, for example. So he's going to be coming back, you know, and, and I'm just mentioning one, which is Ethan, but there's others as well. So what's going to happen with those players? In addition, you've got half a dozen youngsters that we've got from abroad. We've hardly seen them at all this season. And Noam Emerens, um, you know, uh, the Guandanos, the goalkeeper. Um, who else am I thinking of here? Um Mejia, the the you know the um the young he, he's been injured the young centre forward. I mean I think we we beat somebody six one in a friendly just just before the break and he scored five of the six goals or something. So he's somebody we've got Bjorn Hardley who's just starting to show a face in the in the the eighteens. Um, so there's you know Hugo Werf has, has has come on as you mentioned earlier. So I think with those players next season will form the the basis of the eighteens. And all the ones that, that have been pretty much performing in the 18s this season will now be pushing on to the 23s. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave all the 23s? I think this window has caused a real question mark about how to manage that inter interim group of players. So, uh, you know, looking at my list here, um, Beja, Divine, you know, uh, Shortire, Helm, Deji Satona, Anthony Alanga, they're all going to be pushing forward. So where does that leave? The the um, the 23s, the Galbraiths, 
the Mellers, the Barlows, because he's you know Aiden's come back. Yep. What, what is what's where are they going to go? It's a weird age group, isn't it? What's yeah. I mean, I think we share the same opinion on how beige under twenty three football is. And if you're still twenty three and not made your debut at Manchester United, that I got news for you: you you're not gonna. Oh, you're certainly not gonna have a career unless there's been crazy mitigating circumstances. What's like? I, I think the desire for B teams is just not there from uh, from you know League One, League Two clubs whatsoever. I think they'd be a, an absolute outrage. Even though I thought the EFL Trophy was really good, I really enjoyed those games uh, and chatting to some of the players. They really enjoyed the challenge of those games as well. So I think there'd be some desire from Premier League teams to have some sort of competition like that. But what's your thoughts on how you would fix? the under-23 level, because it's just shit, isn't it? Well, I've said for a long time, the players need, when they get to that level, that if you ever watch our under-18s, all through the 2000s, 2012s, 14s, we would play teams um, of, of a similar ilk, and our passing, and, and by the way, all the top 10 clubs would be doing the same thing. It's not just United. But we would be passing them off the pitch, and it would almost be like, what are they actually learning here? And they're not learning a lot. And and it was really interesting. Uh, when, when United's got cancelled, I went and watched a game at New Mills. I just needed a Saturday fix when nothing was going on. <laughs> and the standard of non-league football has actually dropped too. So, and again, I'm generalising because there, there are certain clubs, obviously, where there is. So I think I think you'd have to pick the right league but I'm still a huge advocate for saying to that league, we would like to put Man United into that league at a local level in the Northwest, whatever that league is. Well, like Evo Sticks are level. Whatever the league would be and and just say, right, that's how we're going to play this game because I'm not sure at academy level they're, they're doing anything. And then at that 20, 21, 22 level, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer because the gap's so big now. You know, I, I'm just naming some names here off, off a list of paper. You know, Dion McGee. You know, Dion needs game time. You know, is he going to make it or is he not going to make it? He's a, he's a great lad. He's, he's certainly got the technical capability. Mm. Has he got the physical capability? We don't know. He's never been tested. He's only and he started to play left back for the under 23s in the last few games because he can't get into midfield. Um, Garner, we've mentioned Bernard Galbraith. Levitt, Meller, Gomez, Barlow, Traore, there's another one for you, Elio Traore. You know, he, he probably needs a loan move. Is he going to make it? We don't know. He's, you know, um, and then we've got a whole bunch of whole bunch of goalkeepers. <laughs> we have got a whole bunch of goalkeepers as well. And they're not exactly shitty, but there's some absolute talent in there. Well, Masny looks good. Kovar looks good. Kovar's you know, looked great this year. He's looked great. So, you know, there's, there's keepers there that they need testing. You know, got Dean Henderson, who, for all intents and purposes, wants to come back as a Man United player. So we just, it, I think what's going to happen is the under 23s is going to get worse as time goes on. You're going to get more and more very capable players that even Ollie, with his philosophy, can't play everybody. He can't, even if he played 11, there's another 12 or 15 that won't get games, if you, even if you played 11. And, you, you know, and you only can play 11 at a time. So I think something needs to give. And I don't know what that answer is. I really don't. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, Tony, I'll just say thank you for your time. You're welcome. Um, and I know before we started, you said don't bother mentioning the book. But you know what? While everyone's at home doing nothing, I think it is one of the best books. Mine's upstairs, actually. Uh, one of the best books you can get is Sons of United, written by Tony. I will throw a link to that in the description because it is on Amazon, I believe, isn't it, Tony? No, no, no. It's just direct from us. Is so, it? Okay, I'll get the website yeah. off you then. I'll throw that in yeah. below. Um, so definitely check that out. It is a unbelievable resource for the youth, uh, or the Mujaks, I should call it. Um, yeah. Just right the way through uh, of Manchester United. And there's some fascinating stuff in there as well. So while you're doing nothing, while the posts are still working, um, get yourself one ordered. You will definitely not regret it. But uh, again, thank you, Tony, for, very much for your time. You're um, welcome. Hopefully, I'll catch you at a game in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed, and I'm sure everyone feels the same. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers, Tony. All the best. Cheers.